Good evening, everybody. My name is Laz Alonzo. Some of y'all may know me uh, from Stop the Yard. You might know me from This Christmas, uh, Jump in the Broom, uh, uh, Fast and Furious. Uh, most recently, uh, I'm on a show on Amazon Prime called Avatar. But before all of this happened where uh, I became a actor in Hollywood, uh, I was a student sitting in chairs, just like the ones you all are sitting in right now at an HBCU. I graduated from Howard University. And so tonight, uh, I'm extremely happy to be a part of this uh, town hall meeting because there's a lot of information out there. And uh, a lot of it is misinformation. A lot of it is half truths. And I have found that over the last year, our community has been bombarded with a lot of uh, uh, lack of information also. Just things that confuse you and you don't know if you're doing the right thing or the wrong thing. So tonight's goal is to make it simple. Make it plain, make it simple. Let's get down to the truth and to the facts. So. First of all, thank you for joining us. Uh, you all are tomorrow's leaders, but leading doesn't just start one day in the future. Leading starts today. Leading starts every single day of your life uh, where you start building who you are and that building who you are defines who you will one day be. So I'm gonna get off my soapbox and start kind of breaking down what we're to expect tonight. So. Tonight's program, welcome to the town hall, entitled Calling All Brothers to a Conversation on COVID-19 and the Vaccines, which is being brought to you tonight by the Black Coalition Against COVID-19, HHS, the CDC, the Ad Council, and the COVID Collaborative. Now, we have brought together a very, very uh, esteemed panel of the leaders of your African-American fraternities. Uh, we got the leaders of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Inc. founded in 1906 at Cornell University. I can already hear the brothers throwing out their, their call. Alpha, Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Inc. 1911 Indiana University. Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated 1911 Howard University. Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity, Inc., 1914, Howard University, and Iota Phi Theta Fraternity, Incorporated, 1963, Morgan State University. All HBCUs, and we got other schools in here, uh, but the Divine Nine Fraternities are represented. We did a program last night for the sisters and all the sororities, and tonight we're doing it for the brothers and all the fraternities. And the main point of this conversation is that it, it's going to be an intergenerational conversation. It's, just, it's not just going to be uh, people sitting back and being told this is what you need to believe. No, it's going to be a open uh, forum. It's going to be a town hall setup where the first be, uh, part of the conversation, we're going to have uh, one of the leading doctors at the White House, a brother who's going to come in and break down a little bit of inside information from the top of the food chain that we as a community need to know. And this information, don't hold on to it, share it with your brothers and sisters in your community. Uh, from there, we're gonna have the leading medical experts for every single fraternity that, we, that I just named. And they're gonna help get into a more in-depth conversation of what have we heard, what is true, what is false and what you need to know so you can make a more informed decision um, and, and, and just how to manage and cope with the situation. And then the last part of the conversation will actually be student leaders from uh, these fraternities talking about how COVID-19 impacted their lives. And we really wanna give you information on uh, knowing when you can one day return back to normal, when we can go back to normal. I think that's really on top of everybody's mind is when can we start gathering again? When can we have our step shows again? When can we you know, do what, what, what we consider uh, uh, life 
normal life is again. So hopefully we can get to, to the bottom of things tonight. Um, but it's important that we hear from our medical experts, people that look like us, that sound like us, that we trust, share facts, answer questions, and the leading doctor from the White House, along with these medical experts, uh, help us get to the bottom of things. So without further ado, excuse me, I'm delighted to introduce each of the dynamic leaders on this stage from your uh, fraternal organizations. Uh, this topic is going to be intergenerational, so it's going to include the, young, the youth, so the future of these fraternities, the current uh, leaders of these fraternities, and how we can work together, you know, as one big black community. Uh, starting off, we're going to start with Mr. Sean McCaskill, represented, representing General President uh, Dr. Willis Lonzo III, Executive Director of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, Inc. How you doing tonight, sir? Man, all is well. Just It's a blessing to be here. Thank you so much. So, uh, as you know, we have about three to four minutes per president. I know that if you get the pulpit, you can bring it home, sir. But just <laughs> a little bit of opening remarks and tell us why uh, this topic is so important you know, for the alphas as far as uh, your commitment to COVID-19 programs. Yes, um, thank you so much. And I think that um, a forum like this is exactly what's needed in our communities right now. Um, our general president, Lonzer, um, he has been committed to um, the COVID-19. He has signed what we call a surgeon general. Um, and what he's basically been trying to do is make sure that the right people are sending out the messages and not just because you're in a leadership position, you should be speaking on something. He's trying to get our doctors and our professionals um, to really hit home on the issues, um, to educate our chapters and our communities. A lot of times when we start looking at um, COVID-19 and, and our communities, we have a lot of people that talk at our communities instead of you know, educating our communities. And I think our, our general president is in the mindset of, you know, really educating and, and feeding information to the ignorance that's being put out there. The, the more that we as leaders, because, you know, one of the things that we talk about is that things will change in the black community when those who know better find the courage to do better. And that's our organizations. And it's a beautiful thing to have all the divine nine come together and speak in unity about something called COVID-19 that's you know taking away so many people in, in our communities. So by us coming together like this, this is huge. This is monumental. Um, and I know our general president would have loved to been here to, to bless everyone. Um, but again, we just wanna add to the conversation. We have a couple of our doctors that, that'll, that'll be representing the fraternity and really speak upon it in a way that gives the information that the people need so that they can move forward. Um, and our general president is, is willing to stand in arms with all the divine nine, you know, to collectively come together to eradicate COVID-19 and educate our communities. That's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, moving on, uh, we uh, have Mr. Reuben A. Shelton III Esquire, Grand Polmark of Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated. How you doing tonight, sir? I'm doing well, Laz. How are you? Thank you so much, brother. So please, uh, the floor is yours. Please let us know why a program like this is important and, and whatever opening remarks you feel you know, are appropriate. So Laz, thank you and good evening to everyone. And, and thank you for joining this important discussion. <clears throat> uh, please forgive my voice. I'm overcoming something. I think I've been in way too many meetings and cheering at a youth basketball uh, league over the weekend. But uh uh, if I'm finally getting it back, but it's, it's not 100 uh, percent. Laz, my grandfather used to always say that good communication cures all misconceptions and eliminates uh, uncertainty and fear. And, and, and really, that's why we're here tonight. Uh, and though we, we've gone through this pandemic for over a year and, and now and have made some great strides to defeat it, you know, there, there are still a lot of misconception, uncertainty and fear uh, surrounding COVID-19 and the several vaccines created to guard us against it. And there is still a significant amount of resistance uh, to the vaccines. And, um, and much of it resides in our younger generation uh, who might think that they are just invulnerable to the danger or they don't believe the danger really exists. 
And that's why the discussion tonight is so important. You know, we have our young leaders in the meeting tonight and, and we need to hear from them to get their thoughts on how to navigate these turbulent times. Uh, we have our medical experts in the meeting tonight and we need them to separate fact from fiction uh, about the pandemic and to give us the straight scoop, you know, about uh, the efficacy and the safety of the vaccines. And so Cap Alpha Psi is deeply committed uh, to ensuring that our brothers and the communities that we serve uh, get the truth by whatever means necessary. And we are also committed to ensuring that uh, we all get the much needed vaccines because we are thoroughly convinced that that is the way we defeat COVID-19. So uh, Laz, that's why we're here tonight. That's why we are so committed to this effort. And, and I, I again wanna thank everyone for being with us tonight. And, uh, and just say, may God bless you all. Uh, Mr. Shelton, I think that uh, one of the things that you said that stood out the most to me was how important good communication is. And I feel like one of the things that has plagued, especially our community with this COVID virus has been poor communication. Yes. And hopefully tonight we get to the bottom of things and, and clear up a lot of misconceptions. So thank you so much for that. That's the goal. Yep. All right. Uh, Moving right along, we have Mr. Ricky Lewis, first Vice Grand Basilius for Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated. Fraternity Incorporated. Lewis. Lewis. What's up, Lance? How you been, man? You good? Doing good, brother. I'm about to mute good, myself. Brother. I'm about to mute the myself. floor is yours, sir. The floor is yours, sir. All right. Thank you, man. I appreciate you, man. Good evening to everyone from warm Los Angeles. It's uh, warm out here in California. Uh, on behalf of our Grand Basilius, Dr. David Marion, we're just excited to be here. Uh, with the other brothers of the uh, Divine Nine. Uh, this is so important to us. Uh, we all believe that when folks know better, they do better. And many times in our community, they depend on the members of the Divine Nine. If we say go right, a lot of people in the community go right. We say go left, a lot of people in the community go left. We are the leaders in our community, uh, whether in the church, uh, of course in the fraternity world, the mentoring world, so the men of Omega Psi Phi is standing up and saying, hey, everybody needs to know about this thing called COVID-19. It's really, really important to be informed. Two, you know, information is important. Uh, good sound decisions are made from good information. We have subject matter experts that make decisions for us. We're going to hear about that from them tonight. So it's important that everybody just stay engaged, stay locked in. Thirdly, it's, uh, it's a decision of life and death. If you don't make the right decision about this COVID-19 or this pandemic that we're dealing with, it could be fatal. Uh, a lot of fathers have been lost out of their families. A lot of mothers have been lost. In some instances, moms and dads have been lost and children are orphans. So it's very, very important. And lastly, uh, this COVID-19 thing is serious. Um, we got to get out of this pandemic. We think with this information tonight that's going to go out to everybody, we'll allow everybody to make good, informed decisions as we move forward. And last, thank you for this opportunity. The men of Omega Psi Phi stand in the gap to help any way we can. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Lewis. And uh, one thing that you said reminded me a lot of uh, my time at Howard University. I, I handed out a lot of turkeys during Thanksgiving with the brothers of Omega Psi Phi, you know, and all the stuff that they did in the community. And uh, one thing that I believe all African-American fraternity fraternities have with the community is trust. They trust when they see brothers pull up with, with, with those letters they know that these are brothers that are coming with the intention of, of helping. So uh, th there's a tremendous bond that, that takes place between people who aren't in the, in, the, in the organization. However, they know what you all represent. So uh, uh, thank you for that. And next up, we have Mr. Michael E. Crystal, International President of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated. Yeah, Les, thank you for the introduction. Excited to be here. And, you know, I, I think I want to start my comments building off what you said, and that's that trust. You know, the vision we have for the fraternity, uh, Les, is a brotherhood of conscious men actively serving our communities. And, you know, when you think of the word of conscious, that means there's a level of awareness, which means that you know uh, the subject matters and you have the ability to provide uplift for one another. I tend to believe that uh, our community really creates an opportunity to recognize if we're gonna provide uh, guidance and insight, there's a trust factor that they've established with people who look like themselves. And so we think we can serve as a great resource to deliver that. 
Really excited to have our younger brothers on the call tonight, because as we know, uh, we were the same way when we were young. We thought we were invincible, but here's the reality. The reality is our young people can catch COVID as well. And so tonight, we're gonna have an opportunity for our young collegians to really speak the language that our collegians understand, but more importantly, to make a connection that will give them great insight. I always like saying to our membership, Laz, that for every profession out there, Phi Beta Sigma men are a part. And so this evening, we're gonna have medical experts from each one of our organizations to give color and insight around the real issues. And so when you think about yesteryear, trust was a factor. Tonight, we got medical experts from our profession who look like us, who understand how to not just deliver the facts, but also give that empathetic tone that really resonate with our community. And then lastly, you know, this is a journey. Uh, I think we all had a responsibility. Uh, the Council of Presidents had a COVID-19 task force. When it was time for the vaccination to be had, we agreed that not only would we take the vaccine, uh, but we'd also take a picture and broadcast it to our membership so that it could cascade throughout the community. Why? To whom much is given, much is required. It was important that we set the example. And so as we look forward, we look forward to the opportunity to not just advance the message this evening, but Phi Beta Sigma, as a representative of the Divine Nine, we're in this fight for the long haul. And we're looking forward to doing everything we can to connect with our communities in this fight against COVID-19. Thank you so much, Michael. And, and I'll tell you, the, the, the thing that stuck out to me the most about what you just said is consciousness. Is uh, everything that we do, we must do it with the right level of consciousness. And if we are having this conversation tonight here, is with the consciousness to inform, educate, uh, and, and allow our participants to be able to make informed decisions. Uh, if they're going to get the vaccine, which hopefully they will, it's with an informed frame of mind. It's not, well, I, I guess I should, or I don't know, I'm, I'm hesitant. I, I got the vaccine. I was hesitant too, I'm not gonna lie. I did hours and hours of research, but when I went in, it was with a certain level of consciousness and confidence yes. because I did my homework. So thank you so much for, for bringing that up. Very, very key point. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and next up we have Mr. Andre R. Manson, Grand Polaris of Iota Phi Theta Fraternity Incorporated. How you doing tonight, sir? Brother Laz, I'm doing well. How about yourself? Doing good, thank you. Man, I'm so glad to be here today. I, I got to tell you, these kind of things are very important to us. Uh, you know, as we all are experiencing this difficult climate and surrounding us and our, our culture, and I got to tell you, Iota Phi Theta understands the need of educating and sharing the knowledge of health and wellness in our communities. Like most of us here, we all have some kind of COVID-19 task force, and we've all hosted and participated in forums and webinars or some kind of means of communication. You know, so we understand it's beyond our own organization. It's about our people and our communities. This affects all generations, as was said earlier today, and families. So hence why we believe that platforms like this are so important. You know, we have to reach out to our people. We can't hold others accountable for protecting and training and teaching our people when we can do it ourselves. So, you know, we're not blind to the fact of, you know, our history shows us and has taught us uh, that, you know, we can't trust completely our local governments or those who say that they have our best interests. So the responsibility falls on us. It falls on our shoulders to bring this understanding to our people. Uh, this is why it's so very important and also a blessing uh, that, you know, that we have a lead medical team here that's of experts that's going to uh, talk to us. And they have a familiar background and culture, if you will, uh, to help bridge that gap between medical care and medical uh, welfare of our people. So I'm looking forward to a fantastic forum. This is going to be really good. Can't wait to get it started. Thank you so much, Andre. And uh, uh, I think that's, that's really the best transition uh, for the next uh, part of this program. And that's the fact that we are the bridge. You know, we, we are the bridge for our entire community. It's up to us, you know, to, to share our medical experts 
within the community. They, their voices, I believe, have been underrepresented oh. in this conversation. And so it's up to us to share that information. And that's what we're doing tonight. Thank you so much for joining us for these opening remarks, sir. And we'll see you and the rest of your colleagues later on at the end of the evening for closing remarks. My pleasure. Look forward to it. Thank you so much. All right. So moving right along. Uh, thank you so much, brothers, for that amazing opening. Uh, it really set the tone for tonight's conversation. Next up, we have the White House medical expert, Dr. Cameron Webb. Uh, the brother is literally, like I said earlier, at the top of the food chain. Uh, he's also a brother of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. Uh, so you know you can trust an alpha. <laughs> if one thing we know about alphas is he's done his homework, he's ready. So uh, so, so uh, I'm not going to be able to shake him with any question that I ask. Is that right, Dr. Webb? Oh, I'm ready. I'm ready. My brother. Uh, would you like to say some opening remarks or would you like to just uh, jump right in and, and start this conversation? Well, I'd like to start off with a couple of remarks. Uh, first, you know, when you introduced yourself, you left out one of my favorite characters, which is Mother's Milk from The Boys. So if you haven't seen that show, uh, this, is, this is a brother who's looking out for the youth while, while serving justice, and that resonates with me in a, in a certain way. So, uh, so make sure you, you don't leave him out of, out of the mix. Uh, it's so great to be with you all this evening in a really critical conversation. And I want to frame it in a couple of ways. I want to start off by saying it's been 455 days since the first case of COVID-19 here in the United States was documented, 455 days. And in that time since case number one, we've had over, over 31 million, 31.5 million additional cases. That's just the ones that we've counted. And I'll let you know that disproportionately, we aren't capturing all the cases in communities of color. You know, in that time, we've had about 564,813 deaths from COVID-19. And, and again, disproportionately, those deaths have hit communities of color the hardest. For me, throughout 2020, I was working in the hospital at the University of Virginia as a hospitalist, and I work on the COVID unit at UVA. And I remember my very first week at the hospital during COVID, when we first had patients coming in, it struck me that why do all the patients look like me, look like my family? And it's not because COVID has a preference for people of color. It's because COVID is acting on our societal weaknesses. It's finding those opportunities to hit communities that have often been the hardest hit and the highest risk. And speaking of time that's passed, we're about two hours and 20 or so minutes since George Floyd's murderer was found guilty. Mm. And you can't have a conversation about COVID without having a conversation about social justice. You can't have a conversation about the dynamics with George Floyd's murder without having a conversation about social justice. These twin demics have been playing out over not just the last year and some change, but over the history of this nation. And so this is a really important moment for us to lean in and recognize that the same kind of advocacy, the same kind of passion, the same kind of energy that goes into addressing the racial injustice that is our criminal justice system, that is the over-policing of black bodies, that same kind of energy, advocacy, and passion has to go into our community's response to this pandemic. And people often talk about vaccine hesitancy. And I'll tell you, I hate that phrase. I hate that phrase because I think it misrepresents what's really happening here. If somebody showed up with a needle full of something and told you they're gonna stick it in your arm, if you didn't have some questions, I would have some questions about you. So the fact of the matter is there are a lot of people who are vaccine curious, as I call it. A lot of folks who are wondering about how much confidence they should have in these vaccines, their safety, their efficacy, how much they trust the institutions that are asking them to get vaccinated, how much they trust the government that's telling them it's time to get vaccinated. But even though you'll hear in the news and you'll hear a lot of people say, oh, black people are hesitant to get vaccinated. It's because of the Tuskegee syphilis study from 1932 to 1972. And that's the reason why black people just won't get vaccinated. Well, those adults over age 65, the ones who lived through the Tuskegee syphilis study, uh, the black adults in that age range, well, it just so happens they're getting vaccinated at, at least the same rate or higher rates 
than their white counterparts. So don't tell me that we're not willing to get vaccinated. We just need to hear the truth. We just need to hear the facts. And that's what we're here to give you tonight. So I'm excited to join you all for this conversation. I'm excited for you all to show exactly how you're going to lead from the front, among your peers, among your colleagues, in your families, in your communities, how you're going to show people what we care about and how we're going to protect our communities. Why am I even here? <laughs> Bro, you broke it down. Like, I, I, I'm going to just go watch CNN and watch the rest of the commentary on, on, on Chauvin getting found guilty. No, no seriously, uh, that was uh, a, a, an amazing opening. Uh, you stole my thunder because I did want to bring up uh, vaccine curiousness or, he, or a lot of people call it hesitancy with good reason. Um, Tuskegee is something that has come up in the past and, and it's something that's very real. It's part of our collective history. Um, how do you how do you get over that when you're talking to us? And uh, one one last question before we um, we move on to the next section. When do you think uh, based on what you're seeing and patterns that you're seeing, that we will get some type of normalcy again, that we will be able to gather again, that we will be able to come together again, you know, as 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 one big black happy family. Cause I miss homecoming, I miss step shows. And I think at the back of everybody's mind, you know, I know mine was when I when I took the vaccine was I'm hoping that this is one step closer to going back to normal. That's right. That's the question I got off the phone with my mom a little while ago. She's just like, so 4th of July, though, right? So I think that's that's a conversation that everybody is having. I'll start off with your first question about vaccine confidence. And, and you know, some of those dynamics, certainly the historical dynamics are there. When you ask, how do you get past it? Remember, I'm a practicing physician, so I'm constantly in a in a set of circumstances where I'm offering people a new medication to them and I'm explaining it. And I think that it starts with giving people good information. And so when people say they're not so sure they're going to get vaccinated, the first thing you should do is ask them why, rather than tell them that they're wrong or they're dooming our communities. Just ask them why. That's what I did with my barber. That's what I did with other members of our community. And you really learn quickly what the reason for their lack of confidence may be. And you can fill some of those gaps if you just take the time. So I think that's a starting point. The second thing I always say is I'm one of six kids in my family. I've got my two parents and my wife. And between us, these are all adults that I care deeply about. We have individuals who've gotten the Pfizer vaccine, the Moderna vaccine, and the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And what I always tell people is with all of my medical training, there's not a there's not a single solitary chance that I would let these people I love so much take a vaccine that I didn't trust wholeheartedly based on the science. That's what I devoted my life to, is understanding science, understanding research, and using it to keep people healthy and save lives. And so, of course, when I'm recommending these vaccines to my family, it's rooted in evidence. The fact that all of my family members, uh, any of those three vaccines, got a life-saving vaccine, got a vaccine that'll keep them out of the hospital, got a vaccine that gets us closer to spending the holidays together this year, that is a big deal. And so I think when you tell those personal stories, when you make sure that you connect with people where they are, when you take the time to answer questions, that's how you get past some of those historical dynamics. And the last thing is trusted messengers. It, you, not just anybody can tell somebody. You have to take the time to connect with people. They have to hear it from somebody they trust. Uh, now to the point of when will things get back to normal, my crystal ball is broken. But what I will say is that it's really important for us collectively to recognize the role we have in driving that timeline. If right now, because it's getting warm, we decide to throw away our masks, hang out in backyards together and just pretend like the pandemic isn't happening, well, we'll still be in this moment through the summer into the fall. If we decide that this is the time to double down, this is the time to maintain our discipline because we're almost at the point, 50.4% of adults have had at least one shot of this vaccine. A third are fully vaccinated. If we lean in now, finish the job, we will get through this. And by the midsummer, I think we have an opportunity for a sufficient number of folks to be vaccinated, but we have to do the work first. Got you, got you. No, that's great. Uh, I'll tell you, one of the things that set me at ease and set my mind at ease uh, when I was doing my research um, on de deciding if I was going to get the vaccine was finding out that the vaccine wasn't something that they just developed in the last year, that the actual base of the vaccine is over 50 years old. And I don't think that a lot of people are 
uh, know this information, that it's not something that they just, some scientist, some cockamamie scientist in the lab was like, let's try this. No, it, it's actually something that has been, it, 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 it has been used and proven for years. It's just this little mRNA part that is what allows your body to specifically recognize the COVID-19 uh, virus, right? Yeah, I'm gonna call you Dr. Alonzo. You know, I think I think what what you realize is that yes, this is built on years of research. That mRNA platform, they've been developing that for quite some time, and this is just a unique application of that platform. We've been doing research on coronaviruses as a, a family of viruses for quite some time. It just happened that the research on coronaviruses and the research on mRNA as a vehicle to deliver proteins to the body to for the immune system to recognize those came together at the right time and. Then you add in the billions of dollars invested by the federal government because of their vested interest in seeing this through. And you understand how that research advanced, how we were able to uh, rapidly move from we need a vaccine for this particular virus. We sequenced that virus and now we have a tool to protect people against that virus. It, it didn't happen without significant investment. And, and remember, you know, one of the lead scientists in developing this vaccine is a sister. She's actually a, a soror of Alpha Kappa Alpha sororities, uh, Dr. Kizmiki Corbett. And so I think when, when you think about who was involved in the development of this vaccine, when you think about the fact that of the 75,000 or so folks who were in the phase three trials, you know, there was a good representation of black individuals, over 10%. That tells you that this is this is kind of uniquely a set of circumstances where we can have a lot of confidence in the way this vaccine was developed, in the way that it was engaged with people of color, and in the way that now we've got, you know, over 130 million folks who've been vaccinated. Well, it tells you something. It tells you that this vaccine works and it's safe. Got it. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Webb. Uh, uh, this was really, really great picking your brain uh, for personal reasons too, because I don't get to talk to somebody at the White House all the time. So I wanted to hear it straight from the top of the food chain. This was very informative. And now please stay with us, Dr. Webb, because I'm gonna add the uh, uh, medical experts, the five medical experts, uh, one from each fraternity to join in and add on to this conversation. So from the alphas, we have Dr. Jeffrey E. Sterling, MD, MPH, Fraternity Surgeon General. How you doing, sir? I'm fantastic. It's great to be with you. Greetings, All brother. Right. From the Kappas, we have uh, Dr. Stephen Broughton, Chair of Health and Wellness Committee. Good evening, doctor. Good evening. All right. From the Qs, we have Dr. Jaden Phillips, Vice Chair, International Medical and Health Initiatives. Good evening, sir. Good evening, my brothers. It's Dr. Jadan, Jadan Phillips, Laz. Yes, Good sir, Jadan, my apologies. Right, my brother, God bless. Nice to see everybody this evening. Thank you, you as well. Uh, from the Sigmas, we have Dr. Vernon Rayford, Director of Social Action. Hello, shout out Cam, remember the SNMA days. <laughs> Lars, thanks for having me. Welcome, everybody. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you for being here. And uh, last but not least, from the IOTAs, we have uh, Dr. Victor People, Director of Health and Services Initiatives. So I'm not a doctor, man. Okay. But I put on TV, but I'm not a doctor. Nice, nice. I'm not one either. <laughs> uh, so thank you so much, gentlemen. I guess let's start the conversation off with uh, what are some of the challenges uh, that you face in fighting this this virus from your position? Uh, I know me, I, my, one of the biggest challenges I faced is fighting misinformation. You know, uh, what are some of the challenges you and your practice and your daily uh, jobs do you face with this in our community? Well, I'll jump out there. This is uh, Jadan Phillips. Um, are you, my situation was pretty unique um, because I'm located in the New York City area. And in New York, my neighborhood in particular was referenced as one of the epicenters of the world when it came to the COVID pandemic. So with work, you know, it was intense because we were getting ready to deal with the increasing numbers and we had to redeploy to different areas of our institution but also after work for me, 
I also had a significant, as I call virtual rounds because of where I was coming from and my neighbors and people I grew up with, we were having cases develop like every other day. So unfortunately, you know, one of the things that was mentioned earlier by Dr. Webb, which was the battle against misinformation. In the beginning in New York, I remember people saying, black folks don't get COVID. And unfortunately that led us with a false sense of security. And unfortunately, because of the newness of COVID and the fact that it was happening at such a dramatic rate, a lot of individuals that may not have been sick enough to go to the hospital, they were sent home. And as Dr. Webb mentioned earlier, I think one of the interesting pieces of this pandemic has been its ability to reveal some of the disparities and other um, biases and other dis disadvantages that we have in communities of color. So for me, it was addressing that on a professional level because at work, couldn't take any days off. But the other thing was, how do we help the people in the community? Now, for me as a family doctor, I've always been one about the importance of preventive wellness. And with this, I have seen because of the disparity in that management of our chronic illnesses, in us seeing the doctors regularly, in the presence of us having all of these comorbidities, you saw that our communities from those health standpoints was the low hanging fruit. In addition to that, in New York specifically, a lot of us lived in the got to. I got to live in this apartment where I live maybe with my grandmother or children. I got to take public transportation to work. I got to be in a space where I can't work virtually. And we also had communities as we transitioned into the pandemic or the vaccination where we did not have the resources to provide vaccination initially for our community. So with that being said, as I've mentioned to other people, this became the Super Bowl that I looked at for doctors. You know, this was a time, you know, in New York in 2001, when 9-11 occurred, you saw firemen and uh, police department members step up and this was their moment. Right now as a doctor, because a lot of us got into medicine to address healthcare disparities and improve them, this has been a perfect moment to address it because the COVID pandemic has provided a captive audience for us to do that. Uh, if I could also ask you all, thank you so much, uh, doctor. If I could also ask if you could briefly mention at some point, uh, what has your fraternity done also to address the COVID-19 uh, virus? And if you could keep your uh, uh, microphones muted while uh, another person is speaking, that would really help our sound as well. Thank you, gentlemen. Please, uh, whoever's ready. Uh, I'll just finish real quick so I can let my other brothers go. So for Omega Sci-Fi, um, we started a COVID-19 task force. The initial uh, purpose of it was weekly meetings to address the misinformation and to get good information out to our individuals in the communities because we were seeing that our communities were being hard hit. Initially, we participated in the disbursement of PPE, protective personal equipment to individuals in the community, to our frontline workers who weren't initially provided. In addition to that, as we progressed, we kept updates going on with the pandemic, but we also started to address some of the other issues, the social justice issues, the mental health impact, the impact on our young people, the impact on other aspects of our lives. In addition to that, we've also created a speakers bureau where we have members of our COVID task force that go and partner with other entities in our community, whether it's a local department of health, whether it's a local church, and for the pur uh, purpose of tonight's conversation, also to make presentations at our undergraduate chapters and campuses to get this information to our young people as we see with the progression of COVID that they are becoming much more important as far as us addressing them and making them aware of what they need to do to protect themselves and their communities. So I think, uh, thank you, Dr. Jordan, Jaden. Are we talking? I think for um, us with, uh, I think one of the biggest challenges um, for this, the vaccine, the pandemic as a whole, I love the uh, 
phrase, the term that um, Dr. Um, what's his name, Dr. Webb? Yeah, Dr. Webb used as far as with the pandemics. Um, this came at a unprecedented time um, in our lifetime, and it was a journey that I don't think any of us ever thought that we would have to take. Um, when we, when this pandemic first came about, um, there was so much misinformation because no one really knew what was going on. And the fact that then the social unrest that was going on in our country is well. so we're fighting social unrest. So we're getting messages about black on white officers telling black um, black men and stuff of that nature. But then we also then had this stuff coming from 45 and his administration about this is not real. This is going to go away. So as Dr. Um, Webb stated, his crystal ball, I think all of our crystal balls were broken in that respect because none of us knew. And so the messages that were coming out, we were all playing catch up and how do we get from point A to point B. Um, once it is that there was a quote unquote grasp on the situation, we as a African-American community, we were still stuck in this place because we were under the assumption that we were being missed out on the matching. So when the message started to hit our communities, it was backdated messages and stuff that a lot of our, I don't say they didn't understand, but they didn't understand. And so I think that the thing where with our organization, uh, we had sent out various information regarding the pandemic, um, various messagings. We had several town halls and distributed various food drives, clothing drives, PPE and stuff of that nature. Um, I will pick back off of what the um, Q's had done as well, um, as far as the prayer, uh, the um, programs where the pastors of our organization were able to come together and lift up those individuals that were going through this pandemic. Thank you, Victor. Uh, would anyone else like to share uh, their perspectives, as well as what the fraternity uh, has done. <clears throat> well, as uh, as the chairman, I think, you, I think you hit mute, uh, Doctor Stephen. Uh, try it again. Let's see. Let's see. Let's hear your mic. Can you hear me? Ah, hear you again. Yep, we're good. We're good. Early, some of our, our core programs was dealing with um, mental health, education, and, and awareness and treatment. As the pandemic came about, it, it set out a whole new set of responsibilities for us in terms of our, of our national approach. With the COVID-19, we established a task force, uh, I imagine like, as everybody else did, and, and we wanted to, to educate uh, as many people as possible. So in each of our provinces or, or regions, as, as the case may be, we decided to get, get a chairman uh, of that particular region and get out as much education as possible, uh, initially to the, the uh, alumni members because we were more concerned with older members initially with the, when the pandemic broke. But now it's more important for us to get to the undergraduate brothers because the younger people are now getting affected at a higher rate. And that's where they think the second spike is coming shortly. Because we are our brother's keepers, all of us are, we are our brother's keepers, we are actively checking on brothers and also it, it stressing the fact that there's a significant amount of helplessness. I'm a practicing psychiatrist and in the black community, I've not seen as much helplessness in a long time. Uh, they, 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 they lack hope and they lack education. And the more we can educate them, the more hope that they feel, feel and, and they, they feel less helpless. So at this time, we are also stressing significantly, uh, reaching out to, to brothers and family members and, and, the, and the community to make sure that people are not, not only misinformed, but not getting to the point where they are feeling helpless to the point of having other mental health uh, concerns such as suicide. Suicide prevention has been a significant uh, role in our outreach at this time, and we have, have had a number of brothers that have come forward with projects that are addressing these type of things in the community that have, that have I feel, saved a bunch of lives at this point in time. 
So I tell people all the time as a psychiatrist, the medical aspect of it is significant in terms of the COVID pandemic, but the mental aspect of it is far reaching. It's gonna last past this pandemic and we and we still have to deal with this from, from, from that stand. Thank you so much, Dr. Broughton. Uh, that, that's, that's a huge point that I think is under uh, discussed is the mental health of it all. Uh, Dr. Sterling, and then we'll close with uh, Dr. Rayford. All right, you know, there's so much to this. And first of all, good evening to everyone. Um, obviously, this has impacted the Brotherhood's ab ability to congregate. We've had impacts upon members of the Brotherhood and our families. Um, instead of just focusing on the obstacles, this really has been viewed within Alpha Phi Alpha as a call to action. Um, I'm an emergency physician by training, so I've literally had a captured audience within my national practice. Now, members of Alpha Phi Alpha are everywhere where the need exists to be trusted messengers. And whether it's through the efforts of Brother Dr. Webb, our general president, um, myself, the head of our health and wellness committee, the head of our COVID-19 task force, down to our chapters and brothers interacting with the communities we've served, we've pursued education and equally as important, implementation of best practices as a means of empowering the community to become better stewards of their own healthcare. Because so much of what we've seen now is that the misinformation is a negative. And we don't wanna spend all of our time playing whack-a-mole getting ripped past the fears. We have to empower people and teach people how to navigate this. As an emergency physician myself, obviously I've been navigating infections and other types of diseases for 25 years. So that's type, that type of messaging shows that it can be done. So inside of the fraternity, we pursued multiple type of implementable action, such as being volunteers, being social influencers, co-promoting events. And even now through my office, between now and the rest of the year, we actually are going to be running immunization clinics in seven cities around the United States. So as I said before, Alpha Phi Alpha really is boots on the ground as well as providing information, advice, and implementable solutions wherever the need exists. Got it. Thank you so much, Dr. Rayford. Awesome, so I'll, I'll bring it up. So many of the same things that the um, other experts have talked about, the activities in their fraternity, I, I want to highlight um, my evolution in the um, in the pandemic as also a way to illustrate the fraternity's evolution during the pandemic. What we are seeing now in our professional lives, we are seeing um, learning in real time, and we've learned about the COVID pandemic in real time. This time a year ago, there was many uncertainties. Um, there were debates about whether masks made a difference. And what our fraternity has actually done was we were listening, we were learning, we were identifying those who were experts. And once we knew better, we incorporated that information into our decisions, um, as well as identifying those experts who could bring um, relevant content to the brotherhood and with that also relevant content to the community. And so as we're sitting here, I'm looking back and realizing that we have learned a lot about COVID. There's still a lot more to go, but as a fraternity, we were able to make sure that we weren't just too committed to one course of action, that we were able to incorporate what we've learned and let that data drive our decision-making. And that has helped the brothers, um, helped the communities in which we serve, and has also helped us refocus on our on our mission that we were able to continue our mission despite the flexibility that we needed with COVID. Okay, well, first of all, I wanna thank you all for bringing us up to speed and up to date in how each fraternity has taken a very specific approach. And if I, if I can say there's one theme that I got from every one of you, and that's that uh, while this was an overwhelming task, uh, your, your organizations met and exceeded the responsibility to the community. And for that, I applaud you and I thank you for, uh, for being here. Uh, th this is exactly what uh, we learn at our schools, that our responsibility is as we uh, enter the real world is, is uh, you know, each one teach one and, and, and am I my brother's keeper. So thank you so much, gentlemen, for sharing that. And, uh, and we need to continue to amplify this. You know, our community needs to know that A, your organizations are here for them, 
but B, that we are taking care of each other. So thank you so much, uh, gentlemen, doctors, and, and uh, I appreciate your service. All right, uh, now we're gonna move on. I'm gonna hold on to Dr. Webb. Dr. Webb, you ain't going nowhere because now what we're gonna do is we're gonna hear from our undergraduate fraternity leaders, our students. This is the next generation. These are the people that are gonna one day look at us and call us the OGs, although I already, they already call me the OG and unk and all kinds of stuff. It's all good. Uh, I still look good though. I got the guns, but uh, uh, we got brothers from the Alphas, Kappas, Q, Sigmas, Iotas. I will introduce them now and they will be coming to the stage to give a little bit about how COVID has impacted them on the student side. So from the Alphas, we have Anthony J. Rucker, from Midwest, the Midwestern Regional Assistant Vice President. From the Kappas, we have Evan Jackson, Junior Grand Vice Hallmark. From the Qs, we have Kenton Kelly, Undergraduate Representative to the Supreme Council. From the Sigmas, we have Dane D. Norvell. Norvell, I believe is, uh, am I saying it right, brother? Norvell? I'm sure he'll pop up in a second and correct me if I said it wrong. Uh, the second, International Second Vice President. And from the IOTAs, we have Kendall L. Brooks, Second Grand Vice Polaris. Thank you very much for joining us, gentlemen. How y'all doing this evening? You're on mute. Doing, doing good. <laughs> thank yeah. you for having me. Thank you for having us. Thank, thank you for joining us. Now, I, 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 first of all, uh, I'm going to open up the conversation, but you have a, a brother, uh, an alpha in the room, who literally uh, is uh, one of the key medical experts at the White House. His opening statement uh, should let you know that uh, he is still one of us. And, uh, and I was moved by what he said about social justice and the impact that it has on our community besides uh, health and mental health. Um, so I'm looking forward to how we can share your experiences and maybe get some information from uh, one of the, uh, the key people uh, who can give us the facts, not a lot of the stuff that we see in here online and on Instagram and all that other stuff. So uh, if you can just briefly share, keep your comments down to like, you know, two, three minutes, just briefly share uh, how it, uh, COVID-19 has impacted your life, uh, how it's impacted your campus, your fraternity, and if you have any questions from Dr. Webb that that uh, might help you as a as a student leader um, dispel a lot of the misconceptions that are out there, so please, uh, uh, I'm gonna let uh, let's start with uh, Evan Jackson. Yes, sir, for sure, and thank thank you all for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, really, I think COVID nineteen affected us just like it impacted students across the campus um, in shock, really, and I think that. Um, you know, that shock is still something that we're just now getting over. It was a thing to where, you know, one day we're hearing, oh, COVID is here. Next day we're hearing, you got to pack your bags. Next day, all of our friends and, and, and companions that we have been going to school with are gone. I mean, so thinking about that, I think that it, it, it forced, you know, an environment where a lot of folks had to mature. Um, a lot of folks really had to, had to figure out their priorities because number one, not, a, not only are you leaving the people who you've been with, but now you're becoming isolated and trying to figure out where you're going to go. Um, so I think that, you know, on the flip side of that, it led to a lot of good planning. You know, I hear about a lot of innovative things coming out of this time. Um, you know, folks going home, having time to really think, take a step back and think about what's important, um, as well as what they want to see in the world and figure out their trajectory. So definitely a lot of bads, but but some upside, um, I think, to this pandemic as well. And really, one of the questions that I have in particular is just regarding the um, what we're seeing about a couple of the vaccines. You know, I'm, I'm I see it's really small numbers, especially for like the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. Is that something that students should be worried about? You know, I think a lot of folks love the fact that it's the one day, you know, quick and easy. But is that something that we should really be thinking about? Yeah, I'm happy to jump in and answer that one now. So so um, I love that y'all are so engaged and you you 
know what's going on. You know the different uh, you know, vaccines that are out there and that you know the impact that it has. So of course, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is a little different. You heard us earlier talk about the messenger RNA vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna, but Johnson & Johnson is what's called a viral vector vaccine. So it works through a different mechanism. And you know, as of last week, it's currently on pause. We're not using it um, you know, in terms of federal vaccination efforts. Uh, and the reason is because there were six cases of a pretty rare outcome. It's called cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. So kind of blood clots in the area where the blood drains from your brain, uh, but also low platelet counts. So it's a, a strange combination. We saw a similar pattern with the AstraZeneca vaccine, which isn't approved here in the US, but we saw a similar pattern in the UK. And so when you put those together, what happened is we had six cases out of the 7 million shots of Johnson & Johnson we had administered. And so we paused. We said, actually, let's stop. Let's see how things are looking out of an abundance of caution. And most people have come to me and said, you paused the whole program for six cases out of 7 million? And we said, yes, it's evidence of just how focused on safety this administration is. We, are, you know, The whole effort is about saving lives. The whole effort is about keeping people healthy. So we wanted to take the time to investigate that. So, so I think that um, a couple of things to be really aware of. The first is that you know, as uh, as you all get back to school or you're heading out uh, for the summer, people all often will point to the Johnson Johnson vaccine as a good one for students because you get one shot and then you're done. Um, it is a safe vaccine. I want to be really clear on that. What this pause has allowed us to do is get a sense of you know exactly who is at risk for this extraordinarily rare, rare side effect, and we're going to have that additional information. I'll leave it to the the team at the CDC to ultimately make recommendations on what to do with that vaccine. But just trust that it's not going to come back. It's not going to be available for anyone to use unless we believe that it's safe. We pulled it off. Uh, we paused it until we felt like it was safe. And it's not coming back until we feel like it's safe. Thank you. You're on mute, brother. Kitten Kelly from Omega Sci-Fi. The floor is yours, my brother. Hey, thank y'all for having us tonight. Really appreciate it. Um, when I think about how COVID has affected, uh, affected me and my, uh, my fraternity brothers and people around me, I oftentimes I think about, you know, one day you go on spring break and then you get a call and you say, come back and get your stuff. Um, that, that kind of That's kind of where we're at with that. Um, and and, it's, and it's, I, can, I can say it has made a lot of people um, – you have, to, you have to mature. You have to mature with time. You have to mature with everything else around you because you, you just think about it and you think about where we're going and, and how we're going. So when I think about from our time from last year to now, I also say that uh, we've came a long way throughout that time. And I only say that to say this because um, last year we didn't know where this thing was going to take us. I didn't believe I didn't believe in myself that we were going to have a vaccine this quick. But I uh, I believe that uh, we've came far and I. Uh, and I think I had one question for, for you, Doc. My question for you was, uh, oftentimes you hear people, is this, is this thing going to look like a one-time vaccination thing or are people going to be doing this every year, every other year? How, how does that look? Yeah, great question. I would say I, I do talks like this every single night. I get that question every single night. And so people want to know what the path is forward. It depends on a few things. Right now, we don't know exactly how long immunity lasts. We know it lasts at least six months because that's the outer limit of how long we studied it. Remember, people just first started getting this vaccine in the trials in the late summer. And so, you know, we're seeing that people are maintaining immunity for at least six months, hopefully longer than that. But some of it depends on how long this virus hangs around. The way that these viruses work is that the more chances they have to get into bodies, whether they're young bodies or old bodies, that's the more opportunities these viruses have to replicate. When viruses are replicating, they make mistakes, errors in copying, and sometimes they create even more dangerous variants. And you've heard about the variants that are out there. So the, the race that we're in is a race against the variants. The more people that get vaccinated, the less opportunities the virus has to replicate, even if it's asymptomatic replication in a young, healthy person. It's the less opportunity to create these dangerous variants. And so that's going to impact how well, how effectively these vaccines work. If we end up with a dominant variant that's not as effectively managed by the current vaccines that are out there, we would need a booster of some sort. But that's what we're fighting against. That's why it's so important for us to get as many people vaccinated now before this virus has another chance to shift, to change, and to mutate. I can say that based on my memories of being at Howard, uh, having to wear a mask probably impacted the brothers of Omega Sci-Fi the worst 
because you can't stick your tongue out with a mask on, brother. <laughs> I feel for you. <laughs> no tongue action with the mask. Uh, Kendall L. Brooks, step up Thank to the you. plate, my brother. Thank you, gentlemen, for inviting me today. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak a little bit more. And thank you, Dr. Webb, for uh, taking your time to uh, talk to us young brothers here. Um, so COVID-19 for me was one of the biggest wake up calls I could say for my life, honestly. Um, it made me ask myself, am I doing enough when it comes to me serving my community? Am I doing enough as a citizen of you know my society and a citizen of my campus at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign? And one of the things that I kind of looked at myself and I checked myself was to look at what am I doing in the community that's around me? What am I doing to pour into the people that it's around me? And, you know, for me, when I came back to, you know, home after, you know, spring break and they told us to pack up, I had to, you know, make myself busy. And I started to, you know, volunteer with some of the brothers in the uh, Atlanta area. And that's actually where I'm from. And I, I was, uh, I had the opportunity to be able to give back. And one other thing that COVID-19 actually done to really uh, wake me up is to uh, remind me that I also need to develop myself professionally as well as spiritually. And me focusing on, you know, things like internships as well as me securing a job was also something that put on my main, you know, priority. And uh, from, you know, my question, Dr. Webb, this is gonna be in regards to the vaccinations. Uh, me personally, I'm vaccinated. Uh, I got my, bo my both shots of the Moderna vaccine. Um, me speaking to a young student who's asking, should I get the Moderna, the Pfizer, or the Johnson & Johnson? What do you say? Um, you know, what do you say to a young person who asks that question? Yeah, what, what I said to my siblings, and I have siblings who are 13 years younger than me and six years older than me out of the six of us. And what I said to, to all of them was uh, take whichever vaccine is available to you. All of them will prevent you from dying from COVID. All of them will prevent you from getting hospitalized. I was looking at the data this morning. You know, the, the average age of somebody being hospitalized for COVID just a couple months ago was over 70 years old. It's 59 years old now. And that's because young people are getting hospitalized, right? And so that's what you want to protect against. So I tell people, whichever vaccine you can get, and also the one, you know, in a lot of places, you don't have a choice. In, in some places, you know, you go and you say, which one do you want? But in some other communities, there's one vaccine that's available to you. It's because they all work. It's because they're all effective. And so I just tell folks, take the, vac the first vaccine that's available to you. It'll save your life. Thank you, Kendall. And, uh, uh, my, 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 my love is going out to Atlanta. Uh, I know that you all are definitely fighting for justice uh, and for uh, to, to hold on to all of our rights to vote. So uh, you definitely have an advocate here. However, we can utilize our collective platforms to make sure that, you know, we, we do not get disenfranchised. Um, you know, uh, uh, Atlanta say, I mean, Georgia saved the, the day last election. So we can't let uh, this go un unanswered, what's happening down there right now. So, yes, sir. Yeah. As the late Congresswoman John Lewis said, we got to get into some good trouble. So that's it, I understand that's completely. That's it. Thank you so much. And uh, Brother Matthew Swalik from Phi Beta Sigma, the floor is yours, my brother. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I am not Dane. However, I do work with Dane. Uh, so my name is Matthew Swalik, and I have the pleasure of serving as Phi Beta Sigma's International Collegiate Member at Large. Um, something that has interested me is how COVID has really affected our students, right? When I'm on campus and I'm engaging with the student body, we're talking about how we weren't prepared for the effects of COVID and how that looks in terms of our uh, abilities to perform in the classroom. I don't think students were prepared for their kind of workload management and how that looks as far as also being able to manage your family responsibilities uh, for those students who are parents and jobs, right? I don't think we were prepared to kind of shift into this kind of teacher self mentality that COVID has kind of pushed on us with this virtual education. Um, I think there's something that if you look in the long term, I think students are kind of suffering from that. Um, the conversation that I'm having with my constituents is, is that we aren't prepared and we're not ready. But most importantly, we aren't learning anything. We may be doing better in numbers as far as protecting ourselves from COVID, but academically, we are truly suffering from the fact that COVID is keeping us from being able to interact with our professors, 
for our seniors getting ready to graduate, something that we have been doing for the past couple of years, but now having to switch into teaching ourselves and our switching our study habits as well as maintain our personal lives, I don't think we're really prepared for that, but it's something that as time goes on, we're definitely being able to better equip ourselves with those tools so that we can still perform to the best of our abilities. Um, I don't have a question at the moment for the good brother, but if I do have one, I'll let you know. Matthew, that was uh, uh, powerful uh, and it hit home. Uh, I tried to take a class uh, when COVID first started last year. I signed up to take some online classes and I couldn't believe how difficult it was just to be focused for three hours on a computer screen. I cannot imagine what you all go through having to do an entire course load. So that is, uh, I'm sure all of the brothers and sisters that are watching this feed right now can, can feel you. And I'm hoping that uh, moving forward, there'll be additional resources allocated, you know, to, to help you with, with things like that. And, and building on Matthew's point, um, uh, Dr. Webb, I, I know that you don't have a crystal ball, brother. Um, but this seems to be, in, in my opinion, from what I've seen, one of the recurring themes that keep coming up is when, I know that you can't say exactly when we can go back to school, back to classes, back to formal gatherings, um, but based on the science, is there a safe uh, bet or, or, or is, is there something like I was watching today, they said that somewhere around 40% of the population had done one, at least one of the, of the two shots. What would you say we have to reach to collectively for people to be able, like Matthew, to go back into the classroom, for us to be able to have formal gatherings? Um, it'll be safe for organizations like the fraternities we have present to have in-person gatherings. What, what are we striving for? What do we need to, to aim at? Yeah, so, so you know, th I think that's a great point because a lot of people are looking for the numbers that will guide them. And what I say is the national numbers aren't gonna help you. And the reason is I, I mentioned earlier, it's about just over 50% of adults. So the number you're looking at probably included children, but 50% of adults uh, have, been, have received at least one shot. The truth of the matter is in some communities, that's 70%. In other communities like one I was in earlier today, it was 28%. There's huge variation across the country due to a lot of different factors. And if you look at you know, the, the latest polls, they'll tell you that the white evangelicals or, or rural conservatives are really one of the most hesitant, as they say, or the, some of the individuals who are least likely uh, to get the vaccine at this point. And it's so important to realize that their communities are farther away from having the protection or the herd immunity, as we call it, to feel like you can safely go back into those communities. Things change really fast with this pandemic. And as you know, we've all seen, we've had three surges at this point. We don't want to have another one, right? And any community that's not protected is quite frankly not protected. So the answer to your question is it's inherently local. It really depends on the dynamics in that community. We think herd immunity in terms of stopping that virus from spreading is somewhere between 70 to 80%. We know that about one in five adults, and a lot of them, like I mentioned, are in certain demographics, but about one in five adults right now say they're not interested in the vaccine. That other 80% say that they are, so it's a matter of ensuring that access. And I wanna make one really important point. It's a really difficult time to try to prognosticate and say, when are we going to be able to open up? And so I, I caution any, any groups that are saying, hey, maybe we'll, we'll schedule a meeting for June or July. Maybe that's when we're gonna hit that sweet spot. I say that right now, the better part of valor is caution. You know, we wanna get through this pandemic. We wanna end this pandemic. So if you're in a position, you know, for, for the brothers who are on this call, if your organizations are planning something and you have a big event that you love to do every July, the fact of the matter is this isn't the year for it, right? This is the year to really double down on state Staying safe. That's at least my opinion based on what I'm seeing, because we want to make sure we get to the fall and we have squashed this virus. And we don't do that by wishful thinking. We do that by following science. We do that by being cautious and then we're protecting our future interests. So I just wanted to make sure to make that point. Um, let me see. Am I still on mute? OK, I'm not muted. Uh, I was hoping you would give me a date, brother. <laughs> I was hoping you were going to say, you know, September 12th. 
you know, 3.35 p.m., you can go back to, you know, brunch or every Sunday or something. But I, well, I hear what you go well, and, and I should add, you know, so so the Centers for Disease Control did add some guidelines, right? So for vaccinated individuals, there are a couple of things they can do. They can meet in small groups with other vaccinated individuals, or they can visit with one other uh, un, a group of unvaccinated folks who are from another household. I know that guidance isn't really geared toward college students because that's not the way we move, right? That's not the way that things happen uh, for, for college students. And, and really quickly, I have to give a shout out to the brothers of the IOTA Beta chapter, the Spring 21 uh, line that just crossed. I uh, just wanted to give them a quick shout. But but in any case, I think that um, you know it's so important to realize that this isn't going to play out the way that everybody wants it to play out if we don't double down on those practices. So I, I can't give you a down to the minute, but I can tell you that if we double down on those measures, on wearing your mask, keeping your distance, staying disciplined, it's going to happen faster than if we don't. Got you. All right, brothers. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, at the very end of this conversation, we're reaching the end. Uh, right now, we're going to let you guys leave the room. Um, we're going to then play a video uh, from uh, Dr. Is it Dr. Henry Louis Gates? Is that who the video is of? Da, da, da. I believe, yes, Dr. Henry Louis Gates. Um, but in the meantime, and then at the very end, we're going to have uh, our five fraternity uh, national leaders cl give closing remarks. And then you're gonna have a Q&A, a little question, a little a survey to fill out. It's a fast survey, it's like two minutes. Um, we're gonna post the link for you to uh, click on to do the survey, or there'll be a QR code put on the screen that you can hold your camera phone up to, and then it'll take you to the link. So you can choose whether you wanna use your camera phone with the QR code, or uh, go directly to the link. But this was an incredible conversation. Uh, Dr. Webb, I want to thank you for uh, giving us so much, first of all, truth, uh, honesty, uh, going straight to the point, no sugarcoating, uh, not talking in circles. The brother had answers and certain questions. He didn't have answers and he didn't uh, uh, ju just uh, uh, try to paint a pretty picture. It, we're, we're still in it. We're still in it. Things are getting better. I think it's important that we do focus on the fact that things are getting better. Every time we turn the news on, we hear bad news. We hear negativity. We hear depressing information that doesn't encourage us, you know, to want to push forward. As one of the gentlemen mentioned earlier, you know, how much mental health is a real problem in our community right now. Um, you know, we've lost some very significant people in, in hip hop uh, due to mental health issues. Don't believe that uh, uh, when, uh, a brother like DMX, you know, uh, uh, over overusing certain uh, 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 drugs is, is only a physical addiction. You know, uh, a, a, a lot of our brothers and sisters have fallen to addiction due to the fact that they were depressed, due to the fact that there is a lack of communication and a lack of community. You know, and, and we as human beings, especially black folks, you know, I mean, we always hear the saying, this person is not invited to the barbecue, that person is not invited to the barbecue. The barbecue is an important part of our community, you know, and gatherings, family gatherings, you know, bringing people together music, dancing, you know, once we get off this thing, you know, we're going to watch our little verses tonight. Good, good little celebration going on. But, you know, the, the main thing is, is that we have to uh, uh, reestablish and reconnect as a community outside of when things happen that are bad. You know, we need to be able to come together and celebrate each other again celebrate our black women, celebrate our brothers, celebrate graduations, birthdays, you know, uh, 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 promotions, things like that. You know, so in order to do that and to do it safely, we got to ride this last little wave out and we are getting there. We are getting there. The vaccines are working. Sure, numbers are going to go up. 
Numbers are going to go down. It, you know, it, 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 we've seen that happen. But what I am encouraged by the vaccines right now, because I'm seeing that uh, there are less deaths. That's one graph that I saw today that I was so happy they focused on on the news that the death curve dropped dramatically after February of this year. Once the vaccine really started going out in a strategic approach. So I'm excited. Uh, I'm excited to get back to normal. I'm like y'all, you know, I miss homecoming. I miss step shows. I miss parties. I miss being able to get together and seeing friends I haven't seen since I was at Howard, you know? So uh, let's just do what we got to do right now. Do your research. Be careful where you get information from. Please be careful because there are a lot of people out there misinforming us on purpose because they want clicks, they want followers, they have a new fan base, and they have found it through misinformation and fear. Don't allow fear to hold us back. The only way that we are going to be able to move forward is through confidence and consciousness and information. You know, so I did my research. Please do your research. You have some valid, valid people, medical professionals in your fraternities that, that will give you the right information if you seek it. Don't hesitate. Seek it out. All right, let's check out this video from Dr. Henry Louis Gates. I'm Henry Louis Gates, Jr. We are a people of resilience, never giving up, always giving back, no matter what happens. We fight through the pain. We protect our traditions. We uphold our excellence. So let's protect our lives with vaccines we can trust so we can embrace what matters most. All right. And now we are going to have closing remarks uh, from our national fraternity leaders, starting with uh, Sean L. McCaskill. Uh, representing General President Dr. Willis L. Lonzo III, Executive Director, Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. If you don't mind keeping your uh, remarks to under two minutes, that would be awesome. Thank you so much for joining us again, uh, Mr. McCaskill. Uh, thank you so much. Hey, and let me first by saying you did an outstanding job. Um, really appreciate your dedication to this issue, man. And I think um, for the way that you approached this whole thing, I think it gave a lot of information where there was misinformation. So the way that you were able to keep it real, that, that was, that was outstanding. I appreciate you so much. You. Um, brother Webb, you know, good brother. Look, there goes an alpha man. I'm so, <laughs> I'm extremely proud of you, man. Um, I almost shed a tear, man. Just listen to you. Just relax people um, with your words of encouragement. Um, you didn't sugarcoat anything. You didn't try to over talk it. You just gave the real information the way that it needed to be given. And I think as long as we have people like yourself leading, leading the charge, you know, we'll be able to overcome this. Um, and I think the one thing that I, I really want to take away from this is that things happen for a reason. I think this COVID thing happened for a reason. And it's really to get black, black folks. We got to work on mental health. You know, we really got to focus on the things that we need to focus on so that we can get better as a community so that when things happen like this, you know, we'll be we'll be so much better off instead of us working from behind. So, again, I appreciate the opportunity to speak. This was an outstanding event. Um, and I hope that there's more um, that's out there. And I can't wait to hear the feedback from you know, all participants. Thank you so much, brother. Appreciate you. And as always, the alphas are always represent. Appreciate so, you. Absolutely, my brother. Next up, we have uh, Ruben A. Shelton III, Esquire, Grand Polemark, Alpha Kappa Alpha. I'm sorry, Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated. My brother. Okay, we're going to move right along uh, to uh, David E. Marion, PhD, Grand Bosselis, Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated. Well, Ricky Lewis is here last. We appreciate you, man. Don't worry. Dr. Marion uh, had me to pinch hit for him. Uh, all the way from Los Angeles, man. Kudos to you. Uh, Dr. Webb, man, you was off the chain, bro. Uh, much respect to 06. 
uh, outstanding session tonight. I would just say three things. One, uh, trust the science. Uh, I think Dr. Webb talked a lot about being cautious. And I say be vigilant. Uh, if we're not vigilant, we're not going to get out of this thing, man. No more step shows, no more parties, no more cis suckers, no white parties, no black parties. If we be vigilant, do what we need to do, trust the signs, be cautious, and just do what we're supposed to do, man, we'll be fine. We'll be back to some sense of normalcy at the end of the year, beginning of next year. But my hat's off. Salute to you and your team, last Kudos. Outstanding work by everybody. Kudos to the brothers of the, the Divine Nine, all the fraternities for a job well done. Thank you, man. I appreciate you for allowing us to be on tonight. Thank you so much, Brother Lewis. And uh, uh, trust the science. Absolutely. Trust the science. No true words have been spoken this evening, my brother. Thank you. Uh, and next up, we have Michael E. Crystal, international president, Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated. Thanks, Laz. And um, think about this program tonight. and. Think about 2020. 2020 was pretty much defined by COVID, social unrest, and what I would describe as the most consequential national election we've had in a very long time. And so if you're scoring, let's look at it. The engagement that we saw within the D9 community, I believe through advocacy, through policy, through the election of um, Keith Ellison, as the attorney general for the great state of Minnesota. Today, we got the verdict. We got the verdict that we were in search of if we go back to Emmett Till, mm -hmm. if we go back to Rodney King. But we got that verdict because of what we did in 2018 through the election of Keith Ellison. If you look at the national election, you saw that we came out in mass numbers and the D9 community played a major role in driving that. I love your comment on celebrating the outer from Atlanta and what happened in Georgia, because Georgia was the tipping point for us having the new trajectory that we were moving towards. And so when you think about social unrest, you think about the most consequential election. And then today, today we had real conversation through medical experts who look like our community. So false equivalization, equivalization excuse me, was paused and we were able to make a huge connection. And so when you think about 2020 and you look forward to 2021, the promise of tomorrow is encouraging. And so that's my message to the audience. The promise of tomorrow is encouraging. And to the team who put this together, a huge kudo for serving as an excellent role model and resource for our community. Really excited for having an opportunity to be here this evening. Thank you so much, Brother Michael. Powerful, powerful words. And uh, everything you said about 2020 summarized it perfectly. Uh, I think we witnessed a few moments in history uh, last year. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, uh, last but not least, uh, we have Dr. I mean, Brother Andre R. Manson, Grand Polaris of Iota Phi Theta Fraternity Incorporated. Hopefully we can get uh, Brother Shelton in the room, Brother Ruben in the room uh, before we wrap up tonight. We're going to see if we can get him in after uh, 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 Andre, but uh, ah, he's here. Okay, so Brother Andre, uh, please uh, help help guide us out, and we'll close with Brother Ruben. Fantastic. Hey, you know what? Great job. Great job. Anytime I can see our men, our black men come together under one umbrella to do a per to, to do one thing under a purpose is fantastic. Uh, Brother Crystal, Frater Crystal, and every everyone who spoke today has has hit the nail directly on the head. One of the things I did notice though, as the as the information continues on coming in, we have to that tells us in my organization that we can't just go by uh, what we've heard last month or two months ago or three months ago. Uh, as the new information comes in, we have to continue on uh, grabbing that information and, and putting it out there. Uh, you know, hearing our uh, youth, it sounds like they have the same concerns as some of our elders. Uh, you know, so those questions and concerns still have to be answered. 
uh, if I had to take a page out of our motto for our fraternity, you know, as far as uh, continue on uh, updating our programs and keeping things together, is that we're always going to have to build on what we've got and not rest on it. So continue on pushing through, everyone. Uh, you know, this was fantastic. God bless. Thank you so much, brother. God bless you as well. And keep doing what you're doing. And uh, last but not least, Brother Ruben A. Shelton, the third Esquire, Grand Pole Mark, Kappa Alpha Psi, Fraternity Incorporated. All right, thank you, Laz. I, 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 I apologize. I'm still a technological Luddite when it comes to these things. <laughs> you and me both. It's all good. <laughs> but, uh, but this is a wonderful program. You've done a great job, Laz, and I, and I, and I appreciate this. You know, I go back to what my, my original concept is that communication is going to be the key in this area. We have got to keep talking about these issues because we've known from the very beginning that information changes from time to time. And the information we know that is true today may be different uh, a couple of weeks from now or a couple of months from now. So we got to keep having these discussions and we got to keep talking about it. And as, as uh, Michael Crystal said, uh, we got to lead by example. And we have led by example. Each one of us in the Divine Nine uh, and the Council of Presidents, we have gotten our vaccines and we we televised it, so to speak. You know, we posted it on social media and we got to keep doing these things so that people who might be on the fence will jump off and take the step that they need to take. Uh, we got to continue to help each other. You know, in Kappa, we uh, established a COVID relief fund for our undergraduates where we gave them all grants. Uh, and when the pandemic first hit to help them financially get over the hump. And finally, Laz, you know, we, we got to work in unity the way the, the Divine Nine has in so many areas since I've joined this team. Uh, I am so proud of all of the, the issues that we've taken on politically and in this pandemic. And we have worked together, we fed off each other and we've used each other's concepts to help get through, uh, get through this process. And so we're going to get this done. We're going to get this done, but we got to keep doing things like this, and we will. Thank you so much, Brother Ruben. Uh, I want to thank all the leaders of the Divine Nine and the Divine Nine fraternities who joined us this evening. Um, you all are the, uh, the literally the living example of what each one teach one means. And when I was at Howard, I always looked up to uh, fraternities and sororities uh, that were on campus um, because uh, no matter what the age, they always seem to lead the rest of the students into uh, community, into the communities, into the schools that were surrounding our university. And it, it broke the bubble. You know, it, it didn't allow us to live in this insulated uh, legend. I mean, uh, I'm sorry, this insulated uh, bubble of safety, which was the yard, but we actually went out in the community and helped out however we could. And they were always led by the Divine Nine. So thank you so much for what you have done and continue to do on a, on, on a constant basis. Now, uh, we're going to share right before we close, we're going to share a couple of PSAs uh, brought to you by the Joy Collective, who is run by uh, uh, an HU grad, uh, 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 Kelly Richardson uh, Lawson. Uh, she is also, Kelly, you're a, a I don't want to get this wrong. I believe you're an AKA, uh, but I'm, I'm I, Delta. Oh my God. Okay. I've been fired, folks. I've been fired. Uh, you'll get my letter of resignation in the mail. Uh, if you don't see me after this PSA, you know why. But uh, we're going to play uh, this PSA for you. It's called College Life, it's a beautiful PSA. And then we're also going to give you some resources where you can do your own uh, in from your own research, your own fact checking, and and places that you can get real information from real sources, not somebody in their basement making stuff up. Okay, so uh, here you go. Check out College Life, brought to you by. Uh, Joy Collective, ran by the beautiful women of Delta Sigma Theta. <laughs> COVID-19 has changed how we stomp the yard and fill the beat. Now it's time to take the first step that lets us get back to strolling instead of scrolling. Before we can safely come together, we need the facts. As COVID-19 vaccines become available, you may have questions. 
Is it safe? Should I get it? Is it free? It's okay to have questions. Now get the facts about COVID-19 vaccines at GetVaccineAnswers.org so you can make an informed decision for yourself and for your fam. All right, all right. Uh, and now uh, I'm going to share some of the URLs. These are resources for you to um, snap a picture of with your iPhone or with your, with your Android, whatever it is that you use. Um, and these are places where you can get real information directly from the source. We can do this.hhs.gov, getvaccineanswers.org, blackcoalitionagainstcovid.org, blackdoctor.org slash COVID-19, cdc.gov slash coronavirus. Any one of these, uh, you can get real information that's pertinent to us and questions that you might have so that uh, those that choose to try to misinform our community uh, don't stand a chance. That, that's really what we're responsible to do is share the truth. So if you find some place where you do your resource, your research, and you find some answers, share that. Share that with your fraternity. Share it with your sorority. Share it with your other students um, on campus. And last but not least, uh, before we let you go for the evening, I want to uh, share this survey with you. There's a QR code that you can uh, scan it. Right there it is with your phone, and it'll take you to the survey. Tell us how it was. Tell us what information you got. Tell us what you would have liked to have gotten because we can still improve on this format and get you the information that you need. Maybe all of your questions weren't answered. Share that in the survey. There's also a link at the bottom of that QR code. If you choose to, uh, to punch it into your browser, you can just follow that link, uh, www.surveymonkey.com slash r slash K78P5R5. So with that said, I want to thank you all for joining me. I'm about to log off and go watch Method Man and Red Man. It's 420. You know they're going to be lit on Versus. Thank you for joining us. Keep wearing your mask. Go get your vaccines. Don't be afraid of this thing. We are stronger than this. We as a black community have survived way more and we will survive this. Let's just think of each other. Let's think of our parents. Let's think of our grandparents and do everything in our power to look out for each other. Why? Because we all we got. All right. Thank you so much. God bless you all and have a great night.